Daniel, you read about this guy Eli who was in charge of the uh, temple. He was the high priest, and his two sons were killed because they were pieces of work also. We even get to David, and David um, had a real messed up family. His one son, Ammon, raped his half-sister, Tamar, and then Tamar's brother killed Ammon, and then this Absalom guy who, who did the killing, then later in life tried to overthrow his dad and kick him out of the kingship. Some of these guys are really messed up. Even somebody like Samuel, who was a great leader in Israel, when his time came up, when he got old and it was time for him to be replaced, the people said, we'd rather have a king than have your sons because your sons just aren't very good. So it reminds us that raising a family is not nearly as easy as some people think. They think it's just a matter of getting pregnant and having kids, and so you raise this family. Not if you want to raise a godly family. And I think that's what we want. As you uh, get to this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, listen to verse 3. This is God speaking through Moses. And he said, listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land, flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God, the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. Now, let's stop there and realize that this is really something that all of us want. What we want more than anything else is for our kids to grow up well, to be prosperous, to, to basically have a life that's better than ours. We want them to be well-adjusted. We want them to do well in life. And, and so Moses is saying, I'm going to give you the prescription for how to make that happen. And so we're going to look at that this morning. And there are some real warnings here. And the first warning is about being wary of, wary of inconsistency. Listen to what he says in verses 4 through 6. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you are getting up. So what he's telling us here is that we have to be consistent. If you want your kids to be prosperous... If you want your kids to do well, then you as a parent need to set a good example for them. Let me give you some ideas. The truth is we understand, I think, that our kids are going to catch more than they're going to hear. They're going to catch what we do more than they hear what we say. And so here are some things. They, our kids hear us say that the Lord's the most important thing in our life, but they see that in practice he's only important if something better doesn't come along. They hear us talk about the importance of the Bible, but they know that our Bibles are dusty on the shelf and we never read them. They hear us talk about the peace of God, and yet they see us constantly churning with anxiety in the world. They hear us say that living for the Lord is the best way to live, but they know that when you're with your friends, it's really hard to tell you apart from other non-Christian people. The first job of any parent is to develop consistency in their own life. Consistency in the way that we re relate to our spouse and the way that we relate to our kids, but most importantly, consistency in the way that we relate to the Lord. So I want to give you some uh, ways to help deepen your own spiritual life. Five things. Number one, set aside a time and a place where you meet with God every day. It could be any place. It could be in the morning. It could be at night. It could be at noontime. Maybe it's a, a special place in your house where you go. Maybe it's the, the table that you eat at. Maybe it's the front seat of your car before you go into work. But, but find a place where you know that this is where I meet with God. I remember the great story about uh, Charles and Joanna Wesley, that Joanna had all these kids, and, and the rule in their house was that they knew that when mom took her apron and put it over her head, they needed to leave her alone because she was meeting with Jesus. <laughs> what a wonderful message that sent to the kids. 
there was no place to go. There was uh, no place to go to get away from the kids, so she just used the apron. Maybe that's something you need to do. But the key is to set some time, and, and it's okay for your kids. You don't have to, you don't have to show them. You don't have to, they don't have to see you praying necessarily, but they need to know that you think it's important to meet with God every day. Second, begin a disciplined study of the Scriptures. Now, when I say disciplined, I mean as opposed to haphazard. Haphazard is when we open the Bible, we read a verse, and then we go on. Discipline means that we actually systematically work our way through the Bible. Now, for some of you, that may be, okay, I want to read through the entire Bible in a year. Some may say, I want to read through the entire New Testament. Others of you may just take one book of the Bible and really meditate on it one verse at a time every day for the course of the year. doesn't matter. The amount of time you spend in the Bible really is less important than the intensity that you give to paying attention to it. You can read a whole bunch of the Bible in the course of the year and actually read nothing because you're not paying attention. Have you ever done that? You've read your Bible assignment and you go, I have no idea what I just read. We need to guard against that. We need to be people who are open and listening to the Word of God and really paying attention to it. And if you have to work slowly to do that, work slowly to do that. Third, get involved with other Christians in the study of God's Word. We need each other because when we're together, we hold each other accountable, we cheer for each other, we spur each other on, we give each other perspectives that we need in the world. So, so become involved in some kind of a small group setting, whether it's a, a home Bible study, uh, whether it's a Bible study here at the church, whether it's a Sunday school class, or you just get together with some friends every now and again to talk about the things of the Lord. Be involved with other believers. Fourth, be intentional about filling your mind with good things. We so easily fill our minds with garbage. We need to be intentional about counteracting that. So you need to pick up a good book. You need to monitor the kinds of movies that you're watching. You need to be careful about the kind of music that you're you're filling your mind with when you're not really paying attention. And so we need to be intentional about filling our mind with good things. And then fifth... Be a good steward in all that you have. Cultivate this attitude of contentment and generosity and gratitude in your life, and your kids are going to see it. Instead of always whining about what you don't have, teach your kids to take what they have and to give thanks for it. So the first thing we need to do in order to have a good family is, personally, we need to be consistent. Second, we need to be intentional in the spiritual training of our kids. And we read this in verses 7 through 9. Again, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We need to be intentional about teaching our kids the things of God. Imagine if we took the same approach to hygiene that we often take in terms of our spiritual life. So we say to our kid at the end of the day, um, you know, you really need to go in and you need to take a shower because, you know, you're kind of getting a little ripe. Go in, take a shower, brush your teeth, and your kid says to you, well, you know, I just really don't feel like it today. I'm really tired. And so you as a parent say, well, okay. I hope maybe next week you'll do this. Ew, you better buy a case of Febreze, you know, because you're going you're gonna to need that anytime you go in that kid's room because it's going to stink to high heaven. You better have stock. You better know somebody. You better have a relative who's a dentist because that kid's going to be well, wearing false teeth before they're in high school. They need to do these things. It's important for their hygiene. It's important for dental care to do this on a regular basis. And yet in our spiritual lives, which we somehow think is less important, we just go, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to impose anything on my kids. I don't want to, I don't want to make them. I, I want them to make their own decision. If all your kids are getting is the message from the world, you are basically simply surrendering them to the devil. This is a fight. Everywhere your kids go, they are going to be indoctrinated with the things of the world. And if we do not aggressively seek to counteract that by teaching them the things of God, we will lose our kids for the Savior. So, We can't be hit and miss. So what we're being told here is that we need to read the Word of God. 
We need to reflect on the Word of God. We need to memorize the Word of God. We need to become familiar with the Word of God. We need to share the Word of God with our kids. We need to bring up, bring up biblical principles when we're making decisions. We need our kids to understand that when we make decisions in our house, when God speaks on something, that's what we're going to do. Even when we don't understand it, even when it's not popular, even when it's not what other people are doing, we trust God. And our kids need to see that we actually back that up with the things that we do. So the second thing, we need to be intentional about training our kids spiritually. Third, we need to be aware of being seduced by a surrounding culture. Listen to what he says in verses 10 through 13. Listen to the warning that God gives them. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will dig water from cisterns you did not dig. And you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. It's going to be a very prosperous place. When you've eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must use only his name. Families are under attack, and, and it's not, I'm not trying to be an alarmist, I'm just trying to be realistic here. Think of some of the cultural things that are coming against our families right now. Think about the alarming divorce rate. There are kids in school now, the, maybe even the majority of the kids are, are from split families. And what this is doing to our society is it's giving us this impression that marriage is about being happy. And as long as you're happy, then you stay married. And if you're not happy anymore, then you get out and you go on someplace else. And we've lost this sense of marriage being a selfless thing. It's not about my happiness. It's about me giving to another person and committing to another person. And when we do that, we find happiness. And our society is becoming very shallow and superficial, and the idea of commitment is being lost because we are surrendering it in this most important relationship of our life. A second problem we have is the alarming number of unmarried families. And the idea is, well, marriage is really just a piece of paper. Of course, you always want to say to those people, if it's just a piece of paper, why don't you get the piece of paper? It's because marriage is more than a piece of paper. Marriage is about commitment. And we're teaching our kids that marriage is something, you know, marriage is just about two people living together. It's about shacking up. It's about having fun together. And again, we're losing this sense of commitment. The third thing is really kind of a, a real problem and it is the electronic isolation. Over the last 50 years, we've had this intruder in our families called the television. And if your house is like ours, even the seating in the house is kind of situated so that everybody can see the TV. Now, I don't like that fact, but I do want to be able to see the TV from wherever I sit. So, you know, that, that's the way we set things up. And the television is been given this invitation that we don't even recognize to come in and indoctrinate us and to indoctrinate our kids with all kinds of things. We've brought all these strangers into our house, and what's happened is now we get together as families, and we don't even talk to each other anymore because we're too busy watching television. And then it's got worse, hasn't it? Now we've got the Internet and we've got uh, our tablets, and we've got our cell phones. Isn't it annoying when you're talking to somebody and they get a text, and all of a sudden they figure, they, oh, they got just a second, I got to read this text. Why do you have to read that text? I don't know about you, but when the phone rings at our house during dinner time, we don't feel like we have to answer it. The phone is there for our convenience. It's not there to be our master. Same thing with a cell phone. Every time we turn away from a conversation in order to read a text, we're basically saying, I need to talk to somebody more important than you right now, and it hinders communication. 
we no longer need to, need to know how to talk to each other because we just text each other, and we don't even spell things right. I don't even know half the time I get a text. I don't even know what somebody's saying. You know, they're using all these abbreviations. I'm too stupid to understand what they mean. Okay, LOL, lol, okay, I don't know what that means. I do know what that means, laugh out loud. I, I get that. That one I know, and there's some others that I'm beginning to learn, but, but what's wrong with this? We don't even use real words anymore. I love electronic media. I love that. I, I love my iPad. I love my smartphone. I love the computer. I love the things that I can do there. But it is isolating us from each other, where we are all in the same room, but every one of us is in a different world because we're involved with our electronic media. And somehow, we as parents need to put some limits on that, and we need to work hard to build bridges to each other. Fourth, there's this pressure for the omnipresent parent. And if you notice what's going on in our society, the idea is if you are a good parent, you will have your children involved every night of the week with something. And if you're a really good parent, you will be there every time your kid's involved in something. And so what happens? As parents, we find ourselves running in a million different directions, letting our schedule be dictated by somebody else. And as a result, we say what good parents we are, but the truth is we're still never talking to each other. We're in the same place as our kids. But there's no interaction, there's no training, there's no teaching going on. Then there's the problem of the success syndrome. And this isn't new, this, is, this has always gone on. The success syndrome says that, that my goal in life is that I need to be successful. And in order to be successful, I've got to work more and more hours because we need more and more money because it costs a lot to live. And if we want to be like everybody else, we want to have what everybody else has, we need more and more money. And so I've got to work. And so we're exhausted when we come home. We never see our kids. And what is the payoff to that? We've got a bunch of junk that we get to put on the curb during citywide cleanup so that other people can pick it up and pass it on to other people. Does anybody else see the insanity of this? That we're on this treadmill going no place. And somewhere along the line, we need to say, wait a minute. I need to decide what's really important in my life. And I need to set some limits. I need to set some boundaries and be able to be a person who says, this is what's truly important to me and this is what I'm going to make time for. I don't have time for any of that stuff. We have time for the things that are important for us. And if you don't have time for the things of God, it's because it's really just not that important to you. And then finally, I see a real problem with this family-first obsession. Have you heard people say this? You know, family's got to come first. And I want to say to those people, you have not read the Bible, have you? Because the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will come to you. The Bible never says family's supposed to be first. Now, we should give attention to our family, we should put our energy into our family, but the Lord must be first. And this family first obsession has us throwing aside all the things that truly matter. We say the only thing that matters is keeping my kids happy, going where my kids want to be, doing what my kids want me to do, providing what my kids say they need. And we forget that we're the parents, and as parents, our job is to help our kids learn that Christ is the center of our home that his values are the ones that we want to embrace. So we need to guard against being seduced by the surrounding culture. You've probably heard people say, look, we only live once in life. You know, life is short. You need to grab all the gusto. You need to have as much fun as you can. You might as well enjoy the journey. Do you understand the shallowness of that? Life is short. You might as well enjoy the journey. What if life is eternal? Which I believe it is. We have wasted all this time 
grabbing for what is temporal and giving no attention to what is eternal. How dumb is that? But there's a fourth danger here that we forget what's at stake. Verses 14 through 18, listen to what he says. You must not worship any of the gods of neighboring nations, for the Lord your God who lives among you is a jealous God. His anger will flare up against you, and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massa. You must diligently obey the commands of the Lord your God, all the laws and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. Somehow, we have come to this point where we have seen spiritual training of our kids as of less importance than training them socially, than caring for their health, than helping them become recreationally proficient. And what we're being told here is we must not forget that the thing that's going to have the longest impact on our kids, forever impact on our kids, is the way we train them in the things of the Lord. And the warning is significant here. He says, understand that God is jealous. And he's not saying God has this crazy jealousy where God just loses control. It means that God is passionate about his relationship with us. God cares deeply about our relationship with us, and he's going to guard that with great intensity. And it sounds really strong. I'm going to wipe you out. He says, oh, this is, this is terrible. Look at these consequences. Don't you think that God is giving these consequences to make a point? To say, this is important. Sometimes parents will come to us and, and they say, you know, my kids are just, oh, I can't believe what my kids are doing. I can't believe the things they're involved in. Oh, my gosh, what is going wrong? Why is this happening? And sometimes I would like to say to those people, you know, I think they're doing exactly what you trained them to do. Now, that sounds harsh, so we don't usually say that, but there are times when I think that. You know, I, I, I know how you were raising your kids, and, and they don't value the things of God because you never trained them to value the things of God. Sad, but true. We are told that we are to diligently obey, diligently obey. Sometimes we we neglect to do this with our kids. We say, we just want them to say a prayer. We just want them to learn how to say, yes, I believe in God. I, I trust the Lord. But that's not sufficient. That's not enough to get our kids to heaven. Well, my, my kids got baptized, and they take communion, and, and sometimes they even come to church. Good, but that still doesn't mean anything. Dr. James Kennedy used to use an illustration of a chair, and he'd put this chair out there, and he'd point to it, and he'd say to somebody, do you believe that's a chair? I do. Do you believe that chair is able to hold you up? I do. Is that chair holding you up now? Well, no. What's necessary for that chair to hold you up now? Well, I have to sit in it. It's the same way with the Christian life. People can say, I, I believe in God. I believe that Jesus saves. I believe that his death paid for my sin. I believe that. But is it effective in your life? Not until you're sitting with him. Not until you're walking with him. Not until you're actually in his arms. And when we are in his arms, and this is what we need to get across to our kids, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you need to actually be a follower of Jesus. Merely thinking that you're going to heaven because you said a prayer sometimes, you are deluded, you are mistaken. Being a follower of Jesus is not about knowing certain information. It's not about passing a test. It's not about looking a certain way. It is about walking with Jesus Christ in the course of our life. So, the challenge here is that we as parents have an awesome responsibility, a huge responsibility. But I'm aware that as I speak, there are going to be people who say, you know, I realize it's a great battleground, but I think I've already failed as a parent. Some of you may feel that you've really blown it. 
the truth is, you've, you've done the best you could, and, and all of us do. We do the best we can. But as you look back, you know you've made mistakes. And some of them are whoppers. Perhaps you came to faith late yourself. Maybe you were so wrapped up in your own work or your own pursuits that you have neglected your family. Maybe you've lived your life angry, distant, or mean. Rather than despair, I want to give you several things to think about. Number one, you can't undo the past. We'd like to. I don't know about you, but there's things in, in my life, and I'm sure there are things in your life that you wish you'd go back and you wish you could do them better. We can't. All we can do is acknowledge the things that we did wrong, come before the Lord and repent of those things, confess those things, go to the people that we've hurt, apologize, and then move on from here. Second, please remember that it's never, ever too late to start doing what's right. It's, it's easier if we don't have to start behind the starting line. You know, it, it's easier if we do this from the beginning but it's never too late to start doing what's right. Serve the Lord now. Extend kindness and love to your children. And they may resist it for a while. They may say, you know, I don't buy this. I don't think that this change is real. Keep going. Keep doing what's right. And eventually, eventually, as you continue to be consistent, your kids are going to start to see, you know, I think this is actually real. And maybe... Maybe you can build that relationship. Maybe you will win a hearing for them. Maybe they will forgive you. Maybe you can move forward. Third, trust in the power of prayer. Confess your sin before God and, and ask him to work in your heart, to change your attitudes, to direct your behavior, and then pray, pray, pray for your kids, for your grandkids for your great-grandkids. Pray that God would come upon their life and would win them to himself instead of saying, Lord, please just make sure my kids have a good time, which is the way most of us pray. Please uh, help them to have an easy life. That's really not the goal. Lord, please help them to have a life with you. Help them to be anchored deep, to have deep roots so that in the trials of life, which will come, they will be able to stand forth Remember that relationships aren't fixed by money. Sometimes we think that if we want to fix something, we just have to throw some money at it. We just have to buy our kids better stuff. We need to you know, buy them a nice car, buy them great clothes, buy them the, whatever the case may be. Though all of us kids, no matter how old we are, like it when people give us stuff because we all like stuff. What people really want is relationship. And relationship isn't about money. It's about time. It's about attention. It's about intimacy. And finally, don't ever forget the incredible grace and mercy of God. We are all imperfect parents. Anybody who is a uh, conscientious follower of Jesus Christ understands that we have made mistakes. And our confidence needs to be in the fact that this God who is so rich in mercy will overcome and cover over our sins. That he will fill in the gaps. As long as we're, we're, we're trying to be faithful, as long as we're seeking to honor him, as, we're, as long as we're trying to do what he has called us to do, God has said, don't worry about it. You do the best you can, and I will help you. And I will cover for you. I will fill in some of those gaps. He will supply our needs. He will fill in where we have fallen short. And how about you, but I'm dependent on the fact that it doesn't all depend on me. How much we need that. Because if it all depends on us, I don't know about you, but I think probably we should start saving for our kids' counseling appointments because we're probably screwing them up. But instead, we put them in God's hands and do the best that we can. See, being a parent is a wonderful blessing. But as parents, it's our job to pass the baton of faith to the next generation. It's an important job. But let's also remember that in addition to being a sober responsibility, it's also a tremendous, rewarding, and most satisfying privilege. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us. 
as we know we have influence over people's lives. And maybe it's not even his parents. Maybe it's his aunts and uncles or maybe it's his great aunts and uncles. Don't know what it is, Father, but there are people watching us and there are people we're influencing with our lives and we're afraid of the kind of influence we're having because we're very much aware of our inconsistencies. Probably not as aware as we should be, but we're aware. We know we've messed up. We know there are times when we just get lazy, where we get seduced by the world, where we get caught up in the society's mentality. Father, please help us because our kids and our grandkids are so precious to us. We want to spend eternity with them. We want them to know you because we know in knowing you, they have life. We accept this as our primary responsibility, but we ask you, we beseech you to help us to fulfill it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.